we can cover order of operations in a general sense. Uh, and so parentheses, which is kind of silly to say is at the top of the order because who wouldn't do something inside parentheses before they did something else? It's just a natural thing to do. And then we have our exponents. We want to respect the exponents above whatever comes below that. And then here are the, the, I think these are the two that people get mixed up the most or where the mistakes happen the most would be, uh, for one, we need to do this left to right. Okay. So a common mistake here would be um, if we have um, 8 divided by divided by 2 times okay. uh, It's really tempting maybe to multiply the 2 times the 3, and we would if there were parentheses around it, but because of the uh, again, agreement that we made as, as far as uh, the order of operation, we're going to do multiplication and division from left to right. Not always multiplication first, but multiplication and division from left to right. So what we see here is uh, a 24 divided by a 2 before we multiply by 3. So we want to divide by 4, or divide by 2, excuse me, first. Okay? So we get 12 times 3, and that's 36. Okay? And the mistake would be to multiply 2 times 3 and get 6, divide 24 by 6, and get 4. Okay? That's a common mistake. And also, um, when we come down here and we are doing addition and subtraction from left to right, a lot of times um, if you have 2 plus 3 times, especially if you have like times 5 plus 2, something like that, uh, what we should do is either add these together and multiply by 3 or distribute the 3 into the parentheses. But whatever happens, we should be multiplying by 3 before we add 2 plus 3 really common to add 2 plus 3, get 5, and then take that and multiply. Okay. And I, have, I don't have any argument about that's the wrong way to do it, this is the right way to do it. It's just that this is the way that most of the world agrees to do things, like the order in which everybody agrees to do things. All right. So to help you uh, complete things in an order that, that most people would do it in the world, because the thing is, when you go out into the math world, you're not going to see, well, let me ask you this question again. If we didn't have an order of operations, how would you know what to do and when? How would you know what order to do things? Any way you wanted. It would, okay, it would just be bedlam out there. You could just, whatever you want to do if you didn't, if you weren't told what to do, right? If there weren't an expressed order, an agreed upon order. You could, I mean, if there weren't any order and, and there was no guidelines on, on how to do what first, then we'd be getting all sorts of different results, right? What if we wanted to, we didn't have an order of operations, but we did want to be sure that we always got the same result no matter who did it? Yeah. Parentheses. Parentheses, exactly. We'd use tons of parentheses, a pair of parentheses around every pair of numbers is what we would need to do, right? Okay. Here's like a, a a question that, that somebody asked, and it's a good question because it's not about rightness or wrongness, it's about an agreed upon order. Okay? I think this commu is communicated fairly clearly uh, that this should be negative 5 times 5. Okay? But uh, you may do negative 5 times negative 5. Right? I can see that like, both are kind of justifiable if we don't have an order of operations, but we do. Okay. Would it be a little more clear if I put parentheses around like that? Yeah. You think anybody would write this if I wrote those parentheses? Yeah. Think that's agreeable? No. Okay. So the thing is, there's no parentheses there. We don't have to write parentheses there because there's an assumed and understood set of parentheses around that 5 squared. Because what we have here, before we put parentheses down, is an exponent of 2. And how do we interpret this negative 
as far as like where does it fall in this order of operations? What is this negative? Multiplication. Multiplication by a negative one. So the negative one times something. We can put a negative in front of something. And then we got five squared. So the exponents come before the multiplication by negative one. So we square the five before we multiply by negative, which would give us this and not this. If I want to get this, I would need to do parentheses around the whole thing. And now, I made the multiplication come before the exponent, and I multiply negative 5 times negative 5. Does that help? Okay. If you have a specific question about order of operations, I can answer that as well. Any other questions? have no questions, you're saying, you're good to go, I uh, feel like an expert. If I'm not an expert, then I'm not aware of it, and I'll find out when I take a quiz, but I feel like I'm an expert at this. That's what no questions is saying. Uh, 28 or 28? 28. 28. There's only one 28, correct? Like, there's only a single? Yeah, there's only one 28. Okay. That's 28 in which section? Which section? 1st or should I just show you the right way first? Right way. Yeah, right way first. Right. Okay, so we have these like terms. These are like terms. They're both w squared. So we'll include this positive with the 3. So we have 10 w squareds and 3 w squareds, just like if we had 10 apples and 3 apples. They're the exact same thing. That's what we mean by like terms. 13 w squared. This negative w and this positive 18, negative 4w, and positive 18w are also like terms. We can combine them and we'll get 14w. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. We now go on and make a hyenas error. Okay. Uh, I could continue, and I see this a lot. People will continue to continue, like to combine terms that are not alike and get something like 27w to the third. Can you explain why that's not 27 then? Without saying just something like they're not like terms or they don't have the same exponent. You can't add apples to oranges. Okay, they're different <laughs> things. You can't add apples to oranges. Um, for one, it's addition, and even though the 13 and the 14 can add together, um, since you don't know what W is, and it is addition, there's no way to combine W squared to just W. All right. So two good, like, things that you can tell someone who might be confused. Right? These are two different things. You cannot combine them. Also, let's say you did try and combine them. If I understand Azrael right. You have a w cubed here, but you have w squared plus w here. Even if you could add 13 or 14, you get 27. Look at what you're trying to do when you take w squared plus w okay, and getting w cubed. You're saying, if I understand correctly, this is addition, and this is not. Right? What does w cubed mean? We do have three w's over here, but here we have w times w plus w, plus a w. This is w times w times w. Uh, what's that? I just said dot dot dot. Oh, well, there's dots in between. So it doesn't work out. Um, 
So they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing, so you can't put them together. You can't put apples with oranges. Right. Recognizing that w squared and w are way just, I mean, they are literally in different dimensions. Right. This is in one dimension, and this is in two dimensions. Right. Imagine w is like a length, like a foot. Okay. Can you imagine that? W represents a, a, a linear foot. Okay. Let's say that's w. What would W times W look like? W squared. It'd be a W up and down and W times the side. So we put a W like this, W like this. We make that square. Get both sides W. What's in the middle? W times W. The area of this rectangle is W times W. W squared. Okay. Now that you can see what a W could look like, I mean, that's not what W always looks like, but it could look like this. If this is what W looks like, this is what W squared looks like. Like I said, different dimensions. This is one dimension, this is two dimensions. What if you multiply by another W? How can we show multiplication by another W? And after W to the third, it gets a little tricky. Add a volume to it. Make it into a volume, make it into a third dimension, right? So we take this W times W. This is. Uh, Here's our W, here's our W. We have W times W, and we're going to multiply by another W. And there's another W to multiply by. So the volume of this cube now is W cubed. That's why we give them these names, W squared, W cubed. Now, to do W to the fourth, that's going to be tricky to look at, to see what it looks like. You have to have a fourth dimension and that we could visualize. That wouldn't be. But you can see how w, w squared and w to the third, at least, are completely looking different objects on different dimensions. So you cannot add these together. You cannot take a w squared, you can't take a piece of paper plus a box, okay, and get two paper boxes. Or it's not, they're not things that are the same. You can't compare them, you can't add them together. Okay? Hopefully I give you some intuition about like terms breaks my heart when I see somebody get 27W to the third. Because it means that uh, no, nobody ever explained to them why you can't add W and W squared, or maybe they were having a bad day that, the day that was explained, and it's just been confusing ever since. All right. But hopefully that uh, helps you out. That's not the case. Great question. Any other questions? Feel like an expert, you're ready to show me that you know what you're doing, then show me that by passing in your homework or your pink slip, whatever you have. Okay, uh, so we're reaching the end of my <coughs> stuff at the beginning that I wanted to cover. Stuff that seems to get unnecessarily confusing, okay? And the biggest one is a thing that a graph is some kind of a magical thing that can't be understood unless you know all the right steps, and it's not in all the case. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> first we just start with what a graph is, and it's really a representation of a function. So let's talk about a function, and a lot of times uh, functions are represented as equations, we represent them as tables, we represent them as order pairs, we represent them really as in any way that we want, as creative as we want to get. And the function is a, is a pretty basic thing. Can someone explain what a function does in math, what a function does? Is That's a, a little beyond, like what, the, what a function is is even more simple than that. says that this does this ability or has this function. Okay. Are you talking math or are you talking more general than math? More general. More general. Uh, yeah. Uh, like a, a piece of code.
code could be a function, right? That is what a function does. I'm getting there, I'm looking for even more basic and more towards math. Yeah, the equation where you put in a certain input and get a separate output. Good, and, it, and exactly. It doesn't have to be an equation, but yes, that's exa that's what we look at most of the time is an equation. Right? You put something into it, and something comes out of it. Now, I can represent this in and out as, as an equation, as a table, as I said, an order pair, a graph. All of these things are functions, they're representations of functions. What I want to help you see is a very simple connection between an equation function and a graph function. And the graph of a function and the equation of a function. So we're going to start with an equation, and then we're going to get some inputs and outputs. Okay? So we started with this a few, a few classes ago. Um, you don't have to find that homework that we did, but we did have two functions. We plug some three things into each and found them come out. Okay. So that's what we're going to do again. Uh, start with a fairly basic one, one of the most basic functions we can look at. So the instructions are the same as the homework that first time. I want you to put whatever you want in for x, figure out what comes out for y, and you're done. Okay? And we learned, I think, in, in, in every other two class, some people th put things in for y. Certainly you could, but it would be a lot easier if you put things in for x, because it's easier to choose things for x that are nice, easy values to deal with. Okay? So it's a hint. There, there are things that are easier to plug in for x than other things. Strategic about it, you can make the work easier on yourself. So three things in, three things out. Maybe make a table or, or something that tracks. This goes in, this comes out. Three different pairs. Okay. So I've been asking you to keep track of the inputs and outputs. I'm going to use my default for keeping track of inputs and outputs. That would just be simple. X, Y, chart, input, output, graph, T, chart, whatever you want to call it. It has lots of different names. Um, let's just throw out some things that you guys actually plugged in. And don't tell me what you got out, just tell me what you plugged in. Seven. You plugged in seven. Bridger? Seven fifths. Seven fifths. Negative three. Negative three. Five. Five. Zero. 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 What? What's that? 21 over 15. 21 over 15. Let's see if you can simplify that. Wait, that's the same. That's the same as mine. Seven yeah. Over five. yeah. 20, yeah. We could multiply these by 3. It would be a 20. 1. 1 plug in 1. Sure, that makes sense. I like that we have at least one negative number. Negative 1. Nope. Any others that you feel like are quite clever? Two. Two. Rather one. Okay. Um, now, how many things can we plug in for x? Absolutely an infinite number of things. In fact, just look between 0 and 1. Not a very big space, right, on the number line. How many numbers between 0 and 1 could you plug in for x? Number, right? It's, you get infinitely small, you can get infinitely large. Now that's not always the case, right? Because sometimes like some functions don't like certain numbers. Right? Does that make sense? Anybody think of a like something bad that happens in math. Yeah? Like between zero and one. No, I mean, like, is there anything that I cannot plug in for x here? A repeat. Well, I mean, I mean conceptually, like would anything bad happen if I plug in a repeating decimal? It would be a difficult thing to, difficult thing to calculate, but is it impossible? Now, conceptually, if I had enough time, I could do it, right? But some things just don't compute in math. If you try to do it, it just breaks math. Can you think of anything like that that happens? Do 
just seem to divide by zero mean? Shows like some catastrophic event, very strange looking. And then they, they say that you divide it by zero. You can't divide by zero. It doesn't make any sense. Okay? So if something you plugged in for x caused you to, to divide by zero, you have a problem. That can't happen here, right? Because really what we have is no matter what we put in for x, it's like x over 1. So x is in the numerator of this fraction, and it's never going to like affect the denominator, make it divide by zero. So we won't have any issues here. But in this case, uh, the point is, and absolutely anything can be plugged in for x. So if anything can be plugged in for x, are there some easier things to plug in for x? What do you think? Let's look on this list of things that, that people have put in for x. What's the easiest one? You think? Seven over zero. Zero. zero would be the easiest. We don't even really have to think about it or do anything. We can just look over there. What's five sevenths times zero? Zero. zero. Goes away. The only thing left? Negative three. Negative three. It's done. Okay. Let's, uh, what do you think is the next easiest one? Seven over five. Maybe. Seven over five? Why is that? Why is that so easy? If you multiply a, a fraction by its reciprocal, what do you get? One. one. It's called the multiplicative inverse. Uh, so we get one, and we subtract three, and we get two. Why is seven easy? Because it's just seven over one. So if we take a look at this, five over seven times seven over one. Maybe we're in the uh, cross-canceling mindset. Yeah, we could definitely cancel that seven with that seven. Or maybe we think when we multiply these together, this number will be divisible by seven, so we can simplify that fraction. And that's a good way to think about it. That's, in fact, kind of a proof of uh, cross-multiplication works. Uh, 35 divided by seven is five. Minus three, two. We get two, so that was really easy as well. One. One is easy. It's not too bad, right? At least 5 sevenths times 1 is just 5 sevenths. We don't really have to do much there. Um, another color. Y equals 5 sevenths times 1 minus 3. So we have 5 sevenths minus 3. We just need a com common denominator here. So 5 sevenths minus 21 sevenths. We get negative uh, 16 sevenths. What's that? Oh, you're, okay, you're putting in a mixed number. Negative two and two sevens. So far, of the ones that we put in, like up here on the board, which one has been the least simple? One. One. It wasn't that hard, but it certainly wasn't the easiest. It does rank in the bottom of what we've done so far. We could do negative three, five, negative one, two, Right? All these are going to be fine. We're going to find a common denominator. We're going to put them together. We're going to find a number. It's not going to be that big of a deal. What might be, now that we, we see some choices that were very simple, very easy to do, can we pick another number for down here that's also going to come out with not too much trouble? Almost could do it in there. Negative 7 fifths. Negative 7 fifths. We use that reciprocal idea again. Now it's just negative. So 5 sevenths times negative 7 fifths will be what? Negative 1. Negative 1. So neg negative 1 minus 3. Negative 4. Negative 4, easy. Negative 7. Okay. Negative 7. Okay. Come out to be negative 8. What's that? It will come out to be negative 8. Be negative 8. We'll have 5 sevenths times negative 7. Almost exactly the same as this, except for instead of a uh, 5, we'll get a negative 5. Right? Negative 5 minus 3 will be negative 8. What else? Bigger than seven, it wouldn't be all that difficult. Twelve. Why twelve? Oh, I guess just throwing it out there. Fourteen. I'm thinking I remember this close to twelve. Fourteen. I'm thinking fourteen. Why fourteen? Because if I multiply five sevenths 
by 14, 14 over 1, so I like. 14 is divisible by 7, and we're left with 2. Right? So when I get 5, like this one, we get 10, right? 5 times 2. 10 minus 3, 7. 21. 21, what's another one? 35. 35, what's another one? 42. Any, any number that is what? <coughs> Multiples of 7, right? If I choose a multiple of 7, then this division by 7 will essentially cancel out that denominator of 7. Anything that makes this into this, this expression here, not a fraction, makes our work easy. Okay. So there are choices for x that are easier to work with. All right. You guys remember slope? Remember slope? Okay. It's the idea of the slope is what's behind the fact that 7 and negative 7 and 14 and 0, all of these guys are easy choices for x. It's numbers that are divisible by the denominator you see there. It's easiest to move over by sevens rather than to just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, and so on. Right? Those are the easy choices. Um, Honestly, I didn't fully get how simple this was until I was in college. Maybe you've already gotten it. We all understand different things at different times, and that's great. That's fine. But I was in college before I realized how simple this is. This is a function. This equation is a function. This table is a function, right? Take away the equation, I still have some knowledge of what goes into the function and what comes out. Right? 7 goes in, 2 comes out. 7 fifths goes in, negative 2 comes out, and so on and goes. Another way to keep track of all of this input output stuff is to graph. That's all a graph is. If you ever look at an equation and it says, sketch the graph of this function, and you forget, don't, don't even worry about it. Don't worry about that you've forgotten. At least plug some stuff in, get some stuff out, and you'll have some points. You plot the points, and you connect them as best as you can figure they connect. So let's take some of the easy ones. Here's a real easy one to plot, right? And now I'm going to see if, if we remember. So I want you to draw xy graph, you know, xy coordinate plane. So this is our positive direction for x, negative direction for x, negative for y, positive for y. This is our x, this is our y. Okay. I want you to plot this guy, this one. One, this one. All right, so I'm going to plot all these. Uh, just a little bit of, uh, you know, looking into the future here. Um, try to look at how big the numbers get. Right? And on the x axis, the numbers are going to be as big as 14. So I'll try and make sure that I have a scale set so I can get to 14. I'll just throw a 14 out there. So it'll be 7. Cut it down more if I need to. Uh, it's about a negative 7, negative 14. Let's see, I need to get uh, up to 7 down to negative 8. So the scale will about work here as well. That would be call it 8. And here's negative 7. Alright, so we're going to plot some points. 7, comma, 2. Alright, there we go. 0, comma, negative 3. Now, I'll tell you honestly, when I, when I come around and I see just these points, I like that. I like to see that you have, uh, I know what I, I did kind of imply that you should connect them. I, but I want to discuss here, if I were to connect these, what shape would I get? Um, I should be really straight line. 
think it looks like a line, okay? Let's, let's pretend like you have no idea what a graph of this equation should look like, right? First day, you're new to graphing altogether, okay? You don't know what it's supposed to look like. A straight line would be a, I would feel like a good guess, right? Is it possible, like, could something happen that would cause you to realize, oh, this isn't supposed to be a line? Again, pretend like you don't know that it's supposed to come out to be a line. Let's say that you're not sure that it's supposed to be a line. How would you get more and more and more certain that it is supposed to be a line? Plot more points. And the point I'm trying to make there is that the line that you draw or the curve that you draw is your guess at where all the other points go. Okay? So when you draw two points and you draw a line, I don't want it to be lost on you that that line you're drawing is just all of the points. All we're doing is trying to save ourselves some time. We don't want to plot all of the points. If we did, we'd get the same shape. It would take a lot longer, though. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I would put money on uh, at least a few people in this room in every math class that I have, even in calculus, still not quite understanding that the shape that we draw is all of the points. If we were to plot all of the points and get infinitely, you know, between zero and one, then all of those inputs between zero and one, all infinite of them, uh, we would just get a shape that like all the points would mush together into the shape of the graph that we're drawing. So when we draw this line here, I'm just saying I'm done drawing points. I am pretty certain that if I were to plot any more points, they would just land somewhere on this line. And I would just recreate line. what I've already drawn. What's that? Well, it's not a straight line. Oh, no, it's not. But <laughs> you're gonna criticize me on that until I get your test. It's gonna be really straight. <laughs> of course, a graph is like not, not perfect. And that's why, uh, like, if I ask you if two lines are parallel, it's not good enough to draw a graph and guess if they're parallel or perpendicular or anything like that, okay? Uh, graphs are helpful to help us to understand how a function behaves, but uh, otherwise, there are just certain things that graphs can't do. And we want to be more precise. Uh, sometimes we need to do something else. Decided function was a very simple thing. Put in something and get out something. Okay, so uh, oh, yeah, don't say that. Put in something. That's key. Put in something. Get out something. If you come upon something that, that does this, it's a function. Put something in, something comes out. The vending machine, is it a function? Yes. Yeah. You put in enough money and you type in the letter and the number of what you want, what does it give you? The thing that you typed in that combination of keys for. It's a function. Right? Anything that does that is a function, <laughs> mathematically speaking. So, what's a graph? is its input and output, or all of its inputs and outputs, then a graph is a representation of that function. It's a way to keep track of all those inputs and outputs. Okay? Representation of that, or of a function. Of a function. Okay? There's a little subtitle, a way to keep track. Again, if you come 
upon a function, uh, an equation, and you are like, wow, I think this is supposed to look this shape, and you feel like you can't do it because you don't know how to find all of the pieces that you vaguely remember. Forget about all that stuff. Plug in some x's, get out some y's, plot them, and then connect them once you feel like you've got enough points to draw that shape. Right? Let's do another one. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to, to do all of that. Right? I walked you through little by little by little. And now we're going to do a different function. I want you to put in some things, get some points. Until you have enough points, you feel pretty confident it should look like this. All the other points are just going to be on this shape that I'm going to draw. Okay. So let's do y equals 2x squared minus to learn about functions, to understand functions. Uh, that's going to make it the easiest, but the, make it the easiest to actually have some knowledge to understand really what's going on with graphs and functions. Okay? So can we just throw out some, throw out an input and output that you got? Zero and negative one. Okay, can I get some confirmation on anybody else that tried zero? Should be negative one as well? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, lots of yes. And then what's next? Two and one. Two and one. We get a lot of yeah on that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One and negative two. One and negative two. Yeah. We get a lot of negative. A lot of yeah on that one. Negative one four. Negative one four. We get a lot of yeah on that one. Yeah. Negative two thirteen. Negative two thirteen. We get another negative two thirteen yeah. out there. Okay. Negative and three twenty six. Negative three twenty six. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Two negative three as well. Twenty six. Okay. Uh, just gonna double check that here. Yeah. Okay. Once we start getting into even slightly larger numbers, we can run into mistakes. So let's make sure we have enough room. I should just move this down a little bit. Make sure we can get to 26. Let's call it 26 there. 13 then. Right there, halfway. Uh, four. Yeah, one. So we give it uh, zero, negative one. So there's a point right there. Two, one. Do you think this is a straight line? No. No, it's not a straight line. Okay. So uh, as long as we pointed this, these, we've, we've got the right outputs. We're plotting these points correctly. We're not getting our x's and y's mixed up, right? Be careful of that. We were having that issue really a lot. So negative 2, 13, there's 13. Uh, negative 3, 26, and up there. So it's not a straight line, so it's curved, okay? Very few graphs are jagged and pointy, okay? Very, very few. In fact, it's hard to make a graph be pointy. Okay, so it's going to be a nice, smooth curve. Um, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to picture this guy here. Pretend you know nothing about this function. Okay, something like that. No. 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 Why not? Because you don't know. I don't know what should it happen. It looks like it should reflect the other side. You think you kind of have this uh, bias towards symmetry? You want yeah. things to be symmetrical? Okay, that's fair. Uh, what, I mean, but you don't have any really proof, right, that it doesn't do that. There's gotta be some graph out there that does look something like this. It's yeah. impossible. So what's your proof that it doesn't do that? Um, we don't have a point that starts, like we don't have numbers that start going back down. As far as we know, it just keeps going back up. Okay, so based on what we know, I would say, based on what we know, as long as we pretend like we don't know anything about this graph, right, which is what the, the graph of this function looks like, I would say, right now, the support for either it going this way or the way I've drawn it, maybe there's a little bit more support towards going up more. Can we get more support than that it continues to go upward? Um, if it could have just went straight down, but you put another point up. This one? Yeah. Yeah. So it's well, going to go back up. It doesn't then start going down after that. Oh. 
plot more points. Yeah, right? And the more I plot points, the more I plot points, and the more they go up, and the more they go up, the more I feel like they're never coming down. Let's do, let's do one. Not the number one, but let's do one more point. Do five. Do five. Good. Like a way out there, see if we get this big positive number, then we get. Everybody do five? You did five. What'd you get? Uh, 34. 34. Okay, so that's past 26 by, uh, let's say it just goes to the very top. That's uh, two, three, four, five. And it's way up there. So. Well, it's pretty easy to believe that it keeps going. In fact, look at the function itself. Look at what you do with the numbers that you plug in. If it came back down here, that's what, this is what that would have to mean. There's some number bigger than 5 that I plug in for x that comes out smaller than the number I got when I put 5 in. Right? Yeah. That's what I'm proposing. Does that seem likely? Does it seem like this function will just get bigger and bigger and bigger outputs? Yeah. Yeah. Why does it seem like that? Because. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes? Because if you take a number and multiply it by itself, it yes. subtracts Square itself. Eight. It really doesn't get smaller. So you're saying, even though this is a minus 3x, once I get big enough, once the numbers are big enough, multiplying the number by itself and then subtracting three times itself. In fact, once this number is like past three, once we get to three, then three times three is the same as three times three, but then we get to four, now this starts to be too big for this one to really subtract much off of it, right? And then once this is 10 and 100 and 1,000, and 1,000 squared times two is a whole lot bigger than you know, three times 1,000. You just can't keep up, this guy can't keep up, okay? It's a good observation. That's something we need to know right now, but it is a really good observation. It is the kind of thing that we'll investigate when we get to quadratic functions, parabolas, and all that kind of stuff. So, good, good point. That square, that's, that's going to be a big number when x is a big number. Once it gets beyond some point of equilibrium, then that x squared thing is just going to get way, way big. And it, and it will. What's that? A million squared. A million squared, yeah. What's a million squared is? Really big. Billion times a billion trillion. It's a trillion. trillion. It's a, trillion. Yeah. a million squared is a trillion. And a trillion is minus three million. Not a big deal, right? Three million is, you know, a trillion laughs in the face of three million. Okay. All right, so that's the point there. Really great observation. Uh, it's a good support for this graph just keeps going up. It's not going to come back down. All right, let's do another one. Y equals x cubed times x plus Yeah, plot some points. If you feel like you know what the graph looks like, and then draw a nice curve. 